imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shot and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all Okay. It means something. It means something. You know, that's my take on it. Wait, what's yours? Protonic Reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. It is a science thing. It's a science place. It's a scientific fact. We are all up in your face. It is time for the one, the only... Protonic reversal. Welcome to it. And that was like the uh, that's it sounded like the nineteen eighties ad man from uh, uh, RoboCop. Ah. <laughs> that, that was a that, that was a wild uh, that was a wild thing. All right, here we go. Sid Butler, we're doing this. Hey, 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 man, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Great. I'm sorry this has been so hard for me to connect, commit. Uh, Homeschool has kicked my butt a bit. Yeah, understandable. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of untold stories in rock and roll, and not the least of which is that parents are now teachers, <laughs> as well as is uh, one of the big ones, really. Yeah, it's really it's for me. It's the like, hey, dad, can you get me this, dad? I forgot my, you know, my book for this class. Mm-hmm, mm. You know, real cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the rock and roll like, thing. We're at a, yeah, it's super <laughs> rock. I put my, I put my tattoo sleeves on, shirt, you know, <laughs> and then I go to the store and get milk and eggs. But right. it, it's a daily occurrence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we're talking now, and it's 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 a it's a pleasure to have you on, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks for making the time, man. Doing my best. I'm happy to be thought of. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, well, Sid, thanks so much for coming on the show. This, 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 this is great. You've, you've, you've had a really um, a, a, amazing arc. I, I'm so fascinated by the the AG band stuff, and in in a really cool way, in a way that even if I if I didn't enjoy the output, which I do, it would be like, oh wow, that's like a victory for the weirdos. Like that's like. <laughs> <laughs> punk rock representation in the in the bigger world so while i i do really really want to get into Lee fav and i want to and get into french kiss and all the rest of it uh, i guess can we go ahead and start with that that uh dude you're a late night band I've, and it's awesome <laughs> and it's, it's it's so <laughs> weird it's really i pinch myself all the time it's such a it's i definitely feel that i want such a bore Marnie Stern, Eli Janney. <clears throat> I feel like we won the lottery for all the punk rock indie kids in the world that never had a thought or a dream or their parents said, no, you know, this is stupid. Don't play. We, like we just kept plugging along and all of a sudden we're on a late night show playing punk music that we create every day. It's the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a little bit surreal every time I see it to be like, oh, right. This this is this is the thing, and granted, I guess you know if somebody wanted to diminish it, they'd be like, "Well, it isn't like when it was just Johnny Carson or whatever," which is totally the dick move. Uh, but it's it's awesome because if you think about the fact, like, well, that's regular work as a musician, like doing cool stuff, but it isn't grinding out on tour and you know being up till like three in the morning, like lo- loading up the van and <laughs> and, and, and all so that other free. stuff, yeah. Right? I miss that part of my life so much. I, you know, when you're in it and you're making those long drives and eating crappy food and sleeping on terrible floors or just bad beds, whatever it is, 
you like, oh, God, I just want something normal, like a normal job. And then you get it. And then you're just like, oh, I just can't wait to get back in the van. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's I, definitely a, a grass is greener. But I'm I'm not complaining at all. I, I, you know, Fred Armisen pitched this idea to Seth Myers, and he went for it. And, you know, I can't thank those two enough. But, you know, it, it happened really fast and just – you know, it, it was crazy how it happened over, over like two weeks. That's really wild. So, um, and, and of course, you know, you got you got Eli in there, uh, as you mentioned, Marnie, um, which was also just as a huge Marnie Stern fan. When uh, when I saw that, I was like, "Whoa, that's awesome! <laughs> that's like so cool." How did that uh, group of people end up being? If it came together that quickly, like how, how did that? I mean, that's got to be like a whirlwind, right? I mean, how how did that all come to pass? So basically, in in I was in, so I got a call from Fred Armisen one day saying, "Hey, do you know any guitar players that would want to be in a punk rock late night band?" For Seth Meyers, we're pitching it. Incredible to sentence. NBC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Oh my God, yes, Seth Jabor from the Subway Five is the best guitar player." I know. I mean, he's he's just an incredible melody maker. So he good. Just comes up with riffs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just uh, like. Being with him since we were 17 or 18, he's just I'm blown away with how quickly he can come up with a melody of any genre, of any kind. Just He's like a mimic. And so Seth, I mean, the Fred was like, oh, yeah, he's perfect. And they hung up the phone. <laughs> and the conversation lasted about 25 seconds. <laughs> and then that was probably in October. And then sort of to make a, a, a short story, a long story short, uh, then I got a call in January. I was in Los Angeles. And when the producers of the show said, hey, listen, you know, I'll see you on Tuesday. I was a Saturday night um, at rehearsal. And I was like, what are you talking about? I run a record label. I have employees. I have <laughs> yeah, yeah. coming up. <laughs> right. He's like, You're not sitting around I, waiting to be uh, activated like a robot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he was very blunt. And he basically said, you'll be one of 60 musicians playing music on television. You'll be playing whatever you want with a bunch of punk rock kids. I'll see you on Tuesday and hung up the phone. Oh, wow. And I went back into the restaurant with my wife and said, well, I guess I'm getting on a plane and I'm not going to be the, you know, try out for the bass player for the show. Uh, and then we went back to New York and it was me and Eli and Seth and Fred at the time. We didn't have a drummer and we worked on the uh, closing theme. Fred had already written the opening theme. Uh, and then we just sort of had a rehearsal and, then we did like some test TV shows, some sort of dry runs, and then Seth Meyers was like, "Yeah, I like these guys," and that was it. <laughs> and and that was uh, it was about six years ago, I think, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, two 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 thousand and fourteen was the year. Um, it was a big big year, but yeah. Did you have any uh, any concerns of, of? I mean, it sounds like there wasn't a whole lot of time to sort of second guess it or or be anxious or anything uh, about it. It was just since it happened so quickly, but was there any kind of reticence? That's or a any great kind of... question. Yeah. That's a great, yes, there was. There's a lot of anxiety and Fred was a, just such a, a brilliant mentor to all of us by saying, hey guys, you're making this a bigger deal than it is in terms of being on stage or, you know, you guys have played in front of millions of people, you know, in the course of your history, you've played, this is cakewalk for you. Uh, these are the songs that you're writing and, you know, it's not like you're, covering other people's songs this is just everyone's crazy right now just go with the flow and he was great advice and all of a sudden we became less anxious as we realized we were sort of the stepchildren of the show <laughs> uh, right and and became happy with that role you know and uh and really appreciate the fact that the show allows us to write anything we want they never i'm gonna say probably in the six years we've been doing it Maybe a half a dozen times the producers have kind of looked over from their chair across the room or in our ears and been like, guys, that's not the direction we want to go in. Um, but mostly it's pretty, we get a pretty free, we're pretty free to do whatever, anything we want during the show, which is pretty fantastic. And isn't that kind of what almost every artist wants is just that artistic freedom to kind of explore and, and do stuff and not be told what to do or anything along those lines i mean that's <laughs> yeah and it's really you know it's only five of us total 
and you know when i've reached out to get i've got to know a little bit of the other bands on the other late night shows and you know their situation is very different than ours they have a very different schedule they have very different notes they have very different procedures of how they are supposed to perform and what their expectations are and we just sort of get to do it every one and we respect that that trust but yeah we're very lucky yeah that's kind of that's kind of awesome so is there ever a i mean and you mentioned kind of you know feeling a little bit like the like the stepchildren of, of the crew since you're coming into it from maybe a different world did that turn from being something that made you feel uncomfortable to something that you kind of felt like you were sort of owning and uh, like leaning into eventually? Yeah. Or is it even something you think about I, after a while? I think we lean into it a little bit. You know, it, it kind of gives us our own pod, our own, you know, it, it's changed since COVID has taken over. But right. before yeah. that, we you know we were sort of in a room away from every, from the writer's room and, you know, we sort of kept to our own and, and then we would show up and do our job. And it was it's a, it was an interesting world, but we sort of leaned into it because we could do anything we want. You know, it was our little clubhouse. Uh, and only a couple of writers sort of were allowed into our clubhouse. And it was a nice feeling. And having the rotation of drummers, the producer, Eric Liederman, uh, had, had this idea with Fred to have rotating drummers when Fred's not around. It was a brilliant idea. It really really inspire inspires us every week and he did an amazing job with that idea and and you know he's been overwhelmed with with drummers wanting to play on the show now and i think that it first started it was hard for him to get it and then now you know once chad smith from the chili peppers and abel boreal and you start to have these world-class drummers Tony come Willis. through i mean yeah there's so many great yeah drummers. just we've had i've just as a bass player i've just i've learned so much about playing the bass from all these amazing drummers um, that I can't thank them enough. And I, it, it, it breaks up the sort of Groundhog Day aspect of it. So, you know, we have a new drummer, she comes in, you know, or he comes in and how they play defines how we write that week. And right. it's just been, they're the personalities and you, you bond really quickly or you don't bond. And that's just as exciting as, <laughs> as the process goes, but yeah, I, uh, heads up to Eric Liederman for, for making that the drum situation happen. And now we're getting managers and drummers being like, I, you know, I want to be on the show. And it's like, dude, just because you're a great drummer doesn't mean you can be on the show. It's he's now, he's got a long list of people that are booked and um, people cancel all the time, but yeah, it's a big, it's an interesting twist. Well, because it's alchemy, right? I mean, especially with the rhythm yeah, section. Exactly. And that's something that, that's one of the things I think is so interesting about it is because when you think of things that, you know, swapping anything in and out in a band, you know, a, a, a band uh, of any kind is, you know, there's a reaction that happens that's like between all the members and all the players. But one of the fundamental things that changes a band <clears throat> often is the drummer. You know, dr different drummers yeah. play different styles, even like like small, especially when you're coming at it from terms of, uh, you know, being part of a rhythm section, that the slightest change in, in anything, you know, you, you don't necessarily play the same way uh, for even drummers that have a similar style just because of small things that maybe are imperceptible to the, the audience at large. So it, it almost seems like, like what the AG band does with drummers is almost like when Saturday Night Live has <laughs> like the guests that they write yeah. the comedy with. It's a great point. It is exactly right, you know, that, that there's some great church drummers that come in and they're such good drummers and they're that we stop and just watch them play. Right. You know, <laughs> right, right. They're right. just like what do you that is amazing. What you're none of us have ever played with the caliber of some of these drummers. They're just phenomenal drummers, but they're not used to playing on television or they're not used to writing, you know, they chart all we don't chart our music. We just like take little cliff right. notes. And like, okay, this yeah, song yeah. sounds like a Fugazi song or, or this song sounds like a Cure song or a Smith song or yeah. a, a Motorhead song. And they're like, I've never heard of these bands. <laughs> so there's no, there's you know, no context. There's no frame of reference for it, right? So Yeah, yeah. And, and our shorthand is so fast that we're writing songs in like 10 minute bursts. Yeah. That we know exactly what how the framework of a cure song or, or a minor threat song is. And they're 
I mean, one of my favorite stories ever was there was a drummer that came in. There was this amazing jazz drummer. And we're like, oh, I have to play like a Who song, like a My Generation Who song, like Big Phil's in the beginning. And she was like, who are the Who? And we thought that she was kidding. <laughs> right, yeah, because how do and, you not know the Who? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Who. But to be you know, respectful of her, her process and her life, she grew up in a small town in Illinois. Then she went to music college for jazz. Her family were jazz people. There was no access to the Who. She didn't listen to the radio stations that the Who would be on. And she kind of threw it back in my face and she was like, oh, have you ever heard of blah, blah, blah? You know? Yeah, like, yeah no. right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm sure she and had I was like, other influences that not everyone's yeah. going to know. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, touche, you got me. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway, you should know who the Who are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You might like it. Yeah. You know? I understand if you don't know who Right to Spring are, but you should know who the Who are. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. so, and, and when you're, yeah, when, and it, it seems like there's a combination of, you know, not having tons and tons of time to belabor the compositions and, and like, you know, overthink them or, or, or put too much about it. It kind of seems like you, you might fall into like, a, okay, first decision is best kind of thing. Um uh, you know, do you feel like it, it's something where there's, I mean, at this point, you, you've you done it long enough where there's kind of like this, a, a telepathy of what is and isn't working? Like, do you ever academically think about it? Is it more of a feel thing? Yeah, it's a feel thing. You kind of know, and then, then you have rehearsal. A, a lot of times the, the, the guest drummers will come in and they'll understand writing quickly. They'll get that. And then right. they'll understand being on stage at rehearsal. But then when the show starts, all of a sudden there's a camera in their face. It's different. Pressure's on, yeah. <laughs> it's very different for them. And we realize sort of the psychology of the drummer. That a drummer has sort of this moat or castle around their emotional state. And, you know, they're in these huge bands where the singer or the guitar player carries a spotlight. Right, yeah, and yeah, yeah. They're not the spotlight. The, the jokes would have become as, you know, what does the bass player do after the show? Who cares? Uh, what does a drummer, you know, there's so many drummer jokes, but all of a sudden you realize why they're drummer jokes. Right. And you realize why they're bass player jokes. <laughs> you know, that, that the, you know, does, can you name the drummer of Radiohead? Probably not. Yeah. Most people can't, but they can remember the singer of Radiohead right. or the singer of The Who. I mean, who's a bad example? Because the drummer was just as famous. But, <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But we, yeah, again, the gist of it is 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 still there. The, the gist <laughs> of it is, you know, the singer and the guitar player, but most people don't know the drummer of most bands, uh, or the bass player, and it's where they sit. Uh, so it's interesting. All of a sudden, when there's a camera on their face, and Seth Meyers is going, "This is the drummer from X band," yeah, and they're a star this week. A lot of them Here's your don't close up. know. <laughs> Here's your close up. They're like, what? <laughs> I'm the drummer. Yeah, I'm um, not used. To, I'm unused to this kind of thing, and and, and it's and right. there's not a lot of time f for that too. It's it's kind of like a, it, it's right there and it's happening and it's it, it's. <laughs> yeah, don't mess. This, this is what we practice for for seven hours. Yeah, this don't blow it. Walk <laughs> on this commercial break, and there's and. There's so much writing and we're hearing the show in our ears. We're hearing the song that we're playing yeah. in our ears and we're hearing sort of the stage manager being like, okay guys, time to go. Yeah. So it's a lot of sort of juggling of sounds in your brain. And so a lot of people are like, they might do an extra fill. They might hold it too long and the, we're happy to do it. We have to end tight with them. So sometimes they'll add an extra fill and throw the band off. Yeah. Um, and we laugh at it. But we understand that the the show is not like oh, you know, sort of as great as they are. They only some have gotten worse during the week, but most of the ninety percent of the drummers get after the first show, after the first fill, they go oh, I got this. This is this. This is a different exercise, a different muscle. Yeah, um, it's a different muscle group. And totally. then, yeah, exactly. And then they're great, uh, but you know. Well, we what, just keep calling it jazz. Every time we make a mistake, we call it jazz. <laughs> well, and nobody wants to be in the, uh, you know, I adore the Pink Floyd Life of Pompeii record, but there's that the classic moment where uh, Nick Mason's like, 
uh, doing the film when he drops the stick and it's like right when there's a close up, which has to be, you know, like somebody had to, he had to piss somebody off that day or something. But in a way it's right. awesome because it's incredibly humanizing because it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. These are humans doing this insane thing. We're on the top of this mountain and, you know, playing this thing. But nope, nobody wants to have that specific Nick Mason moment by, uh, by intent. It's something that happens by accident. And I'm not sure if totally. anyone's thinking of live at Pompeii at the time, but that's that that certainly would be on my mind in in a situation where just uh again noticing like how quick the cuts are and how quick you know moments come and pass and it's over immediately absolutely and there's a lot of drummers that keep getting invited back because the show knows that they are trustworthy that they they know that they're happy just to be there that's sort of like camp for the week yeah yeah you know a lot of these drummers are are, you know grammy award-winning drummers or in bands and it's just for them to hang out in new york for a week and hang just and have fun with a bunch of other like-minded musicians and some people try to overcompensate and i think that's when it gets tricky uh you know john theodore is one of the show's favorite drummers just his personality is great his drumming is phenomenal he just gets along with everyone so he's a he sort of is one of the best representations of people coming in and playing he doesn't do too much he does just enough to sort of show off and say i'm actually a really sick drummer and could do a lot more, but I know how to rein it in. Right. Uh, and he looks great in a tank top. So you know, we're gonna do. <laughs> so that works too. Well, because because yeah, because it's it's easy for some people to forget that you know the the best drummers are not necessarily gonna be doing a Neil Peart impersonation. You know, they're yeah, exactly. They're trying to play the song because the whole thing with playing the song is well, not just playing the song. You're playing to the show. It has to fit exactly in to right. what's happening in the show, and and that's a whole that's something that a lot of people never. Their musicians would never even consider. Yeah, you, that's exactly right. So it's yeah, yeah it, it must be fascinating in, in that case. Yeah, to see, you know, what, how what people bring to it, like what kind of what kind of flourishes, what kind of uh, you know where people choose to dig in, uh, things along those lines. It's a uh, seems like it never would be boring. Let's put it that way. It's never boring, and and, and I might love a drummer. I love how they play or she plays uh, or they play and Seth Jabor might hate how they play. <laughs> and Right, right. You yeah. know, it's not going to be a universal gets, constant. Yeah, totally. Yeah, or he loves the drummer and I'm like, this is t- this guy or this is just, I, I have no idea what their feel is, whether, um, yeah, it's a real, <laughs> It's really interesting. It's been an interesting journey for sure, but I I love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Do you have any kind of, and again, just because the rhythm section is, is so important in everything, do you have any kind of subtle or maybe not necessarily overt methods for kind of getting that shorthand for whoever you're playing drums with, how they play? Uh. Yeah. I think maybe unconsciously or subconsciously or in any window, I'm trying to figure out what, what the correct word would be. I kind of say, I'm going to play as least, like, I'm just going to hit your kick drum. My bass lines will be so stupid <laughs> and so easy that my bass drum, my, my bass lines will just be a representation of like, you, I, I'll try to shift into how you play, but then you, you try to shift into what we're doing. Right. It's easier for me to shift into their style now after years of playing with so many different drummers. Then I want to make we all want to make them feel so comfortable so quickly. Yeah. So the the first day of writing the Monday session is always the most complicated because they're a getting to know us. We're in a tiny room. They might not know who we are, how we play, what we're referencing. Then they have to learn the show. Then they have to learn all these things are overwhelmed on the first day. So we just try to make the dumbest songs possible on Mondays. Mm-hmm. Um, and then usually by Thursday, we're, write, we're actually writing songs. I'd be like, this should be on a record. This is so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you're not, you're not like, going to jump out with some Jaco Pastorius stuff uh, when you're still yeah. learning how everyone's playing together. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. That, yeah, so the, and that's, you know... Man, so so how long, how long do you go as a session? Like for for each day, like you know, there, there's a certain time when a band hits a wall, right? Where you know there's nothing more being done. Yeah, Mondays are usually the hardest days. So we, we, in theory, we roll in about twelve or twelve thirty, um, and then 
it's pretty much we break about three for lunch um and then we go back for hair and makeup and then we have rehearsal and then we have about a 15 minute window and then there's the show so mondays are sort of like a packed you know you might have a 10 minute break or 15 minute break here and there but it's pretty focused we're all pretty jacked up on coffee uh thursday it's a much easy it's a you know it's what it gets easier during the week in You're theory the groove of it at that point yeah you <laughs> when they groove um and Eli's the uh, uh, sort of assistant music director when Fred's not around and sort of at the day-to-day guy and he'll be like, okay, guys, let's just come in tomorrow at one thirty, or, you know, everyone seems to get it. So we'll have an easier day on Thursday. Um, so it sort of gets, it just starts out really tough. And then by Thursday, it's sort of like last day of school kind of thing. Have you, and the, the, no need for names mentioned, but have you ever had a Monday where you're like, well, let's see how this goes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know it's in. You know it's in. We call it the back sweats. Right. You know it's in like five minutes. Like, oh, it's gonna be a long week. It's gonna be this. Uh, You're yeah. gonna be earning it that it, day. It, <laughs> yeah. It 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 hasn't happened that often, but when it does, you're just like, this is. It's a very quick glance. We just quickly look around. Like their personality just doesn't fit. Their jokes are slightly off. You know, they're slightly uncomfortable. They're slightly sexist. They're slightly, you know, yeah. they're slightly right wing. And you're just like, really? You believe in that? You were, you're a flat earther? Okay, well, um, we don't know what to say. And why have you watched the show? Have you yeah, watched yeah. The show? Why are you doing this again exactly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, well, this is going to be a fun week. And then you just try to really be kind to them in their process. Uh, but, you know. Do you just kind of zero in on what you think you might, you do have in, in common? Or do you just try to work, work through it? Like, what? I mean, what you're kind of locked into a situation at that point. So. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say only one, one person was a complete. And they actually didn't make it through the week. Really? Um, so that was sort of sad unfortunate but other other than that it's been just a fun amazing interesting process that has just been great it's been a great part of my conscious life as a musician yeah i mean from the outside it, it just there's a definite feel of i mean you guys are doing the work you're doing work but it, it, it looks like it doesn't look like anyone's having a miserable time it looks like it's a blast and that's kind of gives it a unique energy that not, not that other late night <laughs> bands are necessarily slogging through it and you know slapping on a fake smile or anything but like just the vibe of it because of of the way the the band works and the the type of music that's being played and the, and the people that are playing it it has a different feel to it in a way that's very unique yeah we i appreciate that it, it, i think this show the showrunner the head producers is kind of like shoemaker and he he's done an amazing job and he, he put a, he's put a great team of, of people who work at the show. The energy there is very light and warm and loving and people all know each other's names and they're very respectful. And it definitely, it feels like a family with everyone, not just in the band, but also the grips and the lighting guys and the camera guys. And we all get along. Um, so it feels like every show is exciting and fun. And I think that goes all the way to the top of the show. Uh, but then you have all these sort of sub levels and it is fun. And, you know, Marnie is hysterical and Eli is really, you, you know, these guys in this band are just such a bore. It's one of the funniest people I know. And believe me, I think he's the biggest asshole, but I love him to death. <laughs> and he would say the same thing about me. Uh, well, this we when you're probably we have like this... have like a like a brother relationship, right? For as long as you've been playing music together, it, I mean... it it feels that way. But I can't imagine anyone coming in and doing this job. Like, if it's like a bass player, I've had uh, you know every once in a while you don't feel well, or you have to take a personal day. Um, and we've had sort of rotating musicians that have come in and they've done a great job, but it, it's not the chemistry that we have as a band, I think it'd be very hard for people to come in and take our job from us. Right. Because there's, yeah. Cause, cause there's, there's a thing where certain elements can change and 
and, and it works and it's, it's continues being the overall entity but there is the how many things can you change out before it becomes something else or before it like loses some degree of cohesion or, or uh changes into something else really yeah yeah so but yeah we all i think that you know i think there's a reason why most of the staff on the show has remained uh, a couple of comedy writers have left but in general it's been the same the same people on the show for the last six years you know it's it's a fun place to work and they they treat us well what's the thing that you is there anything you wish you could uh go back and and tell an earlier sid about about doing this to give give a little advice yeah i would say looking back to not i took it really my ego in the beginning, I would have told my ego to just chill out. Like just really enjoy it. I think I was really uptight. I think we were sort of uptight the first year. Um, and we were also told we would probably be uptight the first year. Fred was like, you guys are going to be uptight. Don't worry about it. But just slowly try to let that go. And, and I wish I was able to walk in. A little more relaxed. Day one. and Yeah, a little more relaxed. Like this is, they don't, we're the stepkids. It's cool. We're happy to, I'm happy to be a part of the, you know, picked up and taken to the restaurant too. You know, it's, it's Seth's show. Seth is brilliant. He's funny. He's really sharp. Uh, I'm impressed all the time with how sharp Seth Myers is. And it's not the AG band show. It's not a Les Five show. It's not a Marty Stern show. It's not the Girls Against Boys show. It's this Seth Myers show. And all of it is on his shoulders. In the course of the years, he's just risen to the occasion and to the challenge. I, I, I've never seen Seth once be in a bad mood. I've never seen him once snap at someone. I've never seen him be rude to a guest. He's been direct and honest. He's great with the audience. Uh, when we were in the studio, he does a Q and A with the during one of the commercial breaks. It's the longest break. It's about seven or eight minute commercial break, and he does a Q and A with the audience. And 80% of the questions are the exact questions he gets asked every day. <laughs> Which is like and, the equivalent of the, of the uh, you know, Steve Albini being asked about recording in utero or something. Was, okay, here it comes. It, it, exactly. <laughs> and and to give Seth Meyers, you know, over Albini, I'm sure Albini would go say, go fuck yourself. <laughs> but Seth Meyers is like, oh, you know, that's a really good question. Or, you know, thanks for thinking of that. He's always very gracious and respectful of the audience. And and it's his authenticity in that is in his genuine um, excitement for having an audience and understanding where he's come from and where he's at. He always gives a great answer. And he always makes that audience member feel very special. And he's really good at that. And I really admire and respect that. Um, from him you know if someone asked me every day what's it like to pick up a bass i'd be like uh oh my god dude you know, <laughs> i would I, I don't have the stomach for it but right right because then, then you're like well do i take the you know do i be sarcastic do i take the overly yeah. sincere approach you know <laughs> it's hard yeah. it's hard to, to know that that's, that that's coming and be like oh, christ here we go yeah. Uh, so, yeah. He's so good. He, yeah. So, yeah. So the whole, basically from the top down, everyone's show feels this camaraderie and this sort of connection. And then we sort of pot off into our little squads and, you know, try to make that the best it can be. Well, and it seems like that's, th that must be awesome because it's sort of like he's leading by example, right? So you, you don't want to be it, the ones that like the prima donna by comparison or something, or something along those lines. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely not. Yeah, we're no prima donnas. We're so happy to have a hot meal and to go home to our families and our kids and, and to make it happen and show up the next day. I mean, you know, this is a great run. I feel like I'm at a craps table. And I keep hitting, you know, <laughs> I keep hitting the numbers. Yeah, it's 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 and, and I don't you know, I, I'm, I'm it's something that I don't want to harp on necessarily, but it's so unique within within music to have something like that. Like I'm just hard pressed to think of many other things where you would be able to you know work those muscle groups in, the, in that way and, and so consistently and and have it be like you know not like well i'm doing this for a laugh it's like no this is your job and you're very good at it and you're and you're doing it but it's also this surreal situation that if someone were to ask you at a cocktail party you know what do you do 
<laughs> That's a wild answer. <laughs> It, it's a wild, it's a wild answer. <laughs> These are the two things that happen when I say I'm in a late night band. They say I don't watch television. <laughs> That's the first thing they say. Oh, oh, now oh, I have thanks. to stay up okay. and watch it. Great. <laughs> but I'll just say I only watch him online. Really? And I'm like, okay. well now, and then I go, great. Well now we're talking about you, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> but it's very interesting. They don't know what to do with it. Yeah, what, My what, favorite story. Why offer that up? Like, who cares? Come on. But... No, I know. I don't watch TV is my favorite one. Uh, my favorite all-time story, I have to tell you about this song. When I was in middle school, I played trombone in the jazz band. And when I got to high school, I picked up the bass. And I tried out for the like upper school jazz band. And I didn't make it. And the jazz teacher basically the, was like, you're just not good enough. You're just not good. You just don't get it. You just don't get music. Sorry. And I was like, okay, fine. So then I put out a seven inch with my punk band in DC. And I was like, look, Mr. Irwin, I have a, a record. I made a record. And he was like, it's not real. It's not real. But the music you're playing is not real music. Wow. And then there's a friend of mine who lives in New Orleans who lives oddly close by to Mr. Irwin because he's retired now and lives in New Orleans. And she knew the story and she keeps laughing about it because then I put a record out, started a record label, you know, put out multiple records. And every time he's like, yeah, she's like, Sid's doing really well. He's like, yeah, but it's just not real. He doesn't get it. He just doesn't get music. He doesn't get the business. So then when I got Seth Meyers, she reached out to him. And she's like, Mr. Irwin, Sid's on, he's playing bass in a late night band on television. And he was like, no one watches it. No one cares. And I was just like, ah, oh, it's such a Mr. Show sketch. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like, come on, man. Really? Like you're just you're yeah. committing to the bit at that point, right? <laughs> He's really committing to the bit. But uh, you know, it's such a funny place to sit to be like, okay, yeah, you know, I don't play jazz every night in a smoky cocktail bar <laughs> um, in New Orleans. But you know what? That's fine. That's that's a, well to keep you humble, I suppose, right? You know, knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how, how much of a hot shot you think you are, there's a there's your music teacher that thinks that no matter what you do, you ain't shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, my wife is an actress and she does very well. And I remember my uh, there was someone along the way that was like, "Yeah, if you're not doing Shakespeare, you're not a real actress." And she laughed. She was like, "Oh my god." That's so. Oh my god. That, that's so ridiculous. <laughs> amazing. Slash indicative yeah. of a larger cultural trait. The no sell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, she was she's an Emmy nominated actress. She was has done very well for herself, and you know, more people watch the show that she's been on than you know, watch many many shows. So, or many many Shakespeare festivals. So, I'm very proud of her. Yeah, exactly. Who's who's watching the Shakespeare festival? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no dis yeah. no dis to Shakespeare, like obviously, but it's like, come on. I mean, that that's that's the indie cred of theater. To be sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. I, I so I'm a hugely savvy fab fan. I realize we actually haven't talked about like savvy fab at all, like even a little bit. Uh, can do you mind uh, kind of going through some of the records and kind of re- and going through some of that with me? I'm, I'm happy to. Cool. So the the first one, which I went I went back to. I, I kind of came in right after right after Cat Macobra and. and Actually, I think it was when Rome Upside Down came out. Right. My, my introduction to Les Savvy Fav was I was in I was in Chicago for uh, for work or something along those lines. I can't remember. And I was talking to someone at uh, a friend of mine at a shellac show, and I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna go over to the Empty Bottle and go see the Dismemberment Plan." To which she said, "Make sure you get there in time to see Les Savvy Fav." I was like, "Really?" It's like, That's very nice. She, she was like, you will not regret it. You will really enjoy it. I'm like, okay. And this is someone who I trust. So, so I did. And I saw you guys. And sure enough, I was like, these guys are freaking awesome. Like, I had no idea. I I, I was like, some, I had maybe heard the name before. I was like, was well, that French? How do you even say that? Ha, ha, ha. You know, like that kind of <laughs> mindset. Right. And, and you guys blew me away. So it, it was something where there's a certain mindset that uh, to have – to have a band like that, and, and when you have a a front person who's as engaged in that way, 
and right. just incredibly, incredibly sharp. Like uh, how Tim is incredibly uh, present and 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 thoughtful too. You almost expect to see like like a David Yao ripoff or like an Iggy Pop ripoff or something, but that's not what he right. does at all. And it's something that brings in the crowd immediately. And it's something that that wouldn't matter if the band wasn't, you know, shit hot tight and <laughs> and ripping it up and the songs weren't good. But, you know, it, it was quite it, – that band is, is quite the package of personalities and quite the package of players. And it's something that I think is – you know, I, I hope that uh, – I hope that people know because it kind of seems like that era of weird music is sort of downplayed in terms of this, uh, you know, there's almost like this nineties fetishism, uh, now going on, right. which, which is interesting. And it, it just, it, when I think back to it, I think at least have is one of the definitive bands of that decade. And well, that's very kind of you to say. So, I mean, and, and of course it, you know, it didn't necessarily start off like that, but it, it's, I, I just kind of like to start off from the beginning. You guys were a uh, uh, Rhode Island School of Design uh, yep. a, a origin, right? That's that's how it all came together. Yes, we all went to Rhode Island School of Design um, and met there. We were all sort of playing in different bands there, in different projects. Uh, Tim was in a band called Mr. Belvedere, <laughs> and I would totally go see a band called Mr. Belvedere. That's an yeah. amazing name. <laughs> Yeah, he was the singer of a band called Mr. Belvedere. And then we sort of sort of formed Les Sorry Fav uh, as just a way to sort of like distract ourselves from work at school. Um, it wasn't, a, you know, we didn't really want to be serious. It was just, you know, some, there were these great bands that were in Providence at the time. Uh, this band called The Hydrant Terror, Six Finger Satellite. Yeah. And there was a nice blend of bands from... RISD and Brown that were sort of lightning bolt sort of started at the same time. And there was this great, the guys in lightning bolt had this 11,000 square foot warehouse space downtown. And they would just have, par have parties every weekend and bands would play. Uh, and, you know, touring bands would come through and they were like, okay, let's have five, you play with so-and-so and we'll have like, Tricycle racing because it was this huge <laughs> loft. Big, big we'll have spot. wrestling, yeah, or we'll can, have you can yeah. do crazy things with it when you got a big space like that. Yeah. So to sort of play in a band in college, it was sort of your college, like, hey, let's drink beer, hang out with other bands that are touring through, and support the local scene. It, you know, those guys were great at creating this world. At Fort Thunder was the name of the space. Fort Thunder, yeah, thank you. I couldn't, and, I couldn't think of the yeah. name, but I, I am familiar. Yep. And we wanted, wanted to be a part of that, so we started a band and you know we and all of a sudden we made it, we recorded some songs and then we sent this tapes out like all the other bands do and then some people like hey this is actually pretty good and then we went to we went on tour but then after a sort of small tour which is a whole other chapter of my life but uh then tim moved to new york to get a real job and we all sort of followed suit and sort of kept the band going just as, as something to do and Tim lived in a place in Williamsburg with Pat Mahoney, who is now the drummer of LCD, and so LCD Sound System. And he was the original drummer in La Savi Fav. And we just would have practice there and they would have parties. And it sort of was a continuation of our college life, but with real, quote, real jobs. Right. And then La Savi Fav started to sort of carve out its name as the yeah, yeah, yes came up and as Interpol came up and the strokes and all this, these scenes sort of came up and it sort of mirrored or reminded us of the days in Providence where we would be asked to play on these shows with these bands that were sort of on their way up or coming through or, you know, we knew that we were not going to be the yeah, yeah, yes or the strokes or, or the Interpol or whatever those bands were. We were just sort of these art kids that just wanted to have a good time at a show. Um, we sort of weren't thinking about a career as like a, I'm a professional musician. Right, right, and and that's in in that in that vein, like it almost seems like there, there was in the Bay Area it, it, where I'm from, Oakland, it, it, the A minor Forest and the fucking Champs were very similar. To the fact that they always played support for like the awesome band that was coming through, and it was something right. where it's like, oh, cool, that's gonna be awesome because I know that you know. Our forest or, or, or fucking champs are going to be incredible as well, and, it, and it's something where it's a uh, like a shine theory, right? Everyone makes it themselves look 
everyone makes it, the great, others exactly. look better. Eh, sorry. Yeah, and, and Tim Green is the best from Absolutely. fucking chance. Those yeah. guys are awesome. <laughs> um, I actually have a totally random story. We had the same birthday. Really? Okay. Um, and we, we grew up in D.C. together. And there was a moment when we were at this bar called Dante's, and everyone in the bar had the same. We were all born on August 15th. Wow. And it was kind of creepy. That's like a Twilight the Zone guitar episode player, or something. Yeah, it was super <laughs> Twilight Zone. The guitar player from this band, Circus Lupus, his name is Chris. His birthday is August 15th. Uh, uh, Craig Wedron from Shutter to Think, he's August 15th. Um, so the, all these DCs, that this guy Joey P, I think, is August 15th. So basically, it was kind of freaky that everyone in this room all had the same birthday. Yeah, that's really weird. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that that doesn't happen very often. Uh, although I, I will say that uh, <laughs> uh, Craig's been on the show, and uh, I, I do I do know I do know Chris Thompson too. So that's a small world. I get to punk rock, right? It's, of course, it's a small world. Yes, small world. Um, so that first yes, record right. is uh, three fifths, which is funny because <laughs> there's like of the of the people in the band at that time. There's there's you know only only three of the five. <laughs> <laughs> went forward because right. you had two guitar players at the time. Three fifths, I think, is where we're going to start it. from the beginning, and we're going to stop when we get to the end. Sounds like a good plan. Uh, yeah, three fifths. Yeah, I think we we just to recap, we were just trying to be a band that could hang out with the other bands and make music and sort of create our own vision of a of a band that we wanted to be in. Uh, but yeah, it was a really exciting times to be part of the Lightning Bolt, Fort Thunder, and Six Finger Satellite, and the Hydrogen Terrors. So these, great, <clears throat> excuse me, these great bands that were popping up in Providence, and we were so happy to be a part of that. And then we moved to New York and decided that it was time to make a record. And we met this guy named Chris Newmeyer, who uh, was friends with a, another friend of ours who had just started a record label, and he decided that our record was good enough to put out. So he put it out and that was self-starter, right? Yep. Self-starter foundation. And we are very close with Chris to this day, actually. Uh, he's been a great uh, friend to us all these years. <laughs> we have a cat that I hate, but we have. <laughs> we have a cat that, that really wants to be in on the discussion, I think, is what it sounds like to me. <laughs> it, she does. She also wants to be in the discussion every morning at 530 in the morning. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Uh, I know those feels very well. Where, yes. It's like, why are you activating right now? I don't, <laughs> this is not for you. <laughs> yeah, we. it's funny. If I say I have a kitten, people are like, oh, I'll take a kitten. If I say I have a cat, you want a cat? They go, no. <laughs> Yeah. It isn't cute when they get older, right? <laughs> no, they're not cute when they get older. But she's a sweet cat. I have a soft spot for her, but she does every morning at 530, I want to throw her across the room. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing how, how cats can simultaneously be like so nocturnal, but then also so incredibly active at you know the, yeah. the worst part of the morning where you're just like, ugh. God, why? My favorite yeah, now is uh, you, you just see him like snoozing like all day, like resting up for, you know, the evening lays about. Yeah, I agree. That's her in a nutshell. All day, <laughs> sleeping on our bed. <sighs> what are you going to do? Cats. What are you going to do? Cats, exactly. If I remember right, uh, did, it was that, that was the one where you had the, uh, the shower caps. Yes, right? that's right. Which is which is a pretty clever little, little extra uh, thing. What, did, was that just like a hey, let's do something cool with this kind of thing? Was there another uh, idea behind it? I think there's a couple ideas behind it. One was we wanted to do something unique and sort of artistic, and then I think Chris came up with the idea. I'm pretty sure he came up with the idea of the shower caps. Uh, it was a great idea conceptually. Uh, now I think the records are unplayable because the, the, you know, whatever plastic resin or something is in the shower cap does not D didn't, didn't go well. Age well. <laughs> yeah. If you can find one on eBay that plays, congratulations. 
Oh, that's sweet. Um, but yeah, Chris, I think, you know, they were like multi it was also just cheaper. Like you could just get the vinyl made for a certain price and the shower caps you could buy in bulk. So it was actually cheaper than getting the cardboard. Yeah, the, the packaging. Uh, yeah. The packaging is a hell of a lot cheaper for sure. But that almost reminds me of like, a, I think it was a, was a tumor circus that had the the collector's record that had a hole drilled in it so you could even play it. Like the, the ultimate collector's item. Right. Oh, I like that. I never, I never knew that one. Yeah, that was the uh, it was um, J- uh, James Tornay from King Snake Roost and Steel Hole Bathtub with Jello Biafra, and yeah, you couldn't even actually play the record, but it, it was sort of like a statement on like the collectors the market. Collectors. Yeah, 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 and, and the, the 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 fetishist item, if you will. Right. That's uh, a, that's very clever. So yeah, and that one had uh, Jatem. It had uh, blackouts, false starts. It's some songs that. Kind of still, you guys would still pull out uh, live, like all through the years. Like it, it, it endured as something. And the reason why I say that, is especially when there's a, you know, any kind of lineup change or not that there was like, not that you guys were playing ska or anything, but like stylistic shifts, sometimes it tends to be a, a tendency to abandon uh, older material. But I always appreciated that as a, as a catalog band, like you guys would still pull those out well when appropriate. And it, it still sounded. It still sounded vital. Like it still worked. Like within the rest of the set, was it? Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I I think that this. I mean, as long as Seth is playing guitar, we just would always try to keep those songs. I mean, we wrote them and we loved them. I think the since La Sorry Five wasn't cranking records out that we sort of really cared about the songs that we wrote, uh, and going on tour or just being like, hey, you know, maybe someone from that's here to see us is forty five years old and was there from the beginning. So let's play a song from that era as well. And it just helps us complete our set list a little easier. It's like, okay, two songs from Three Fifths, two songs from Cat and the Cobra, two songs from Rome. And then, you know, four or five from the most recent records. But they're just fun to sort of dig up and they sound fresh when we go back and like, oh yeah, how was that? Oh yeah, Jutan, that was so much fun. How does it go again? Right, right. Yeah, and it's- it, 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 Yeah. I was just gonna say, it seems like you really would put sets together uh, almost like you're making a comp tape or something like, like, like for other music fans, other music nerds. Yeah, we definitely, that's how, that's our, definitely our approach. It, it's not just like, here's our new record. I hope you like it. And we're not going to play anything off the old ones. Yeah, and if you don't pound sand. <laughs> yeah. And some of the songs on the newer records, we, we played once and we realized they were just meant for recording. They weren't really good live. Oh, and so we sort of, since we cared about the live show, we care about the live show so much that we're like, okay, what songs are the best live that will keep people's attention for 50 minutes? Well, and, and those are, you know, that's the, that's the difference between making records and playing live, right? You don't, you, if you have a deep catalog too, that you don't have to play every single song. And you also having the awareness of knowing when something is working and when something doesn't live or when something like, not that it isn't working, but just, yeah, that was fine. As opposed to like, yeah, but this one rips. <laughs> like people yeah. get joy out of this one, and that that one, it's like people are like, yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how we feel. Like we have fifty minutes, <laughs> right? You know, and and now that we've sort of we've been playing festivals before COVID, we were playing like, oh, you know, we'll play one or two shows, but we'll play a festival slot. So like, how's what is the the most bombastic, brutal set we can play that? We'll get our heart rate up as well as hopefully the people in the audience that have either seen us before or might not have seen us before. Absolutely. And also, do you want to? I have a funny side story to tell you. We always play with certain bands over the years. We have the same booking agents, or booking agents, or other booking agents. So we always find ourselves on tour with Matt Smouse, who's on that head. Um, but we always seem to play shows with Shellac. I don't know what it was, but it was great. He played with the Schlack. They're amazing. And they would always kick our ass. They would always <laughs> just blow us out of the water. They're such a phenomenal band. And there was one show in London. It was somewhere in Europe. And we had one of our best shows ever. And they were playing after us. And I literally like walked past a beating, kind of like bumped his shoulder. I was like, yeah, go, good luck. <laughs> they had they had like one of their worst shows I thought. Oh no! <laughs> and then the next show we played at uh, ATP with them, and they were it was like a, a Halloween ATP, 
and they dressed up as Dracula, the mummy, the Frankenstein, and Dracula, or something. And they were so good. Yeah. They were the best I'd ever seen them in you know 20 years. And I'll be the walks off stage and I'll like, yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a good touche. It was, I laughed so hard. I was like, yeah, you got it. You guys are back on top. It was such a, a nice moment. But yeah, we tried to have the bangers ready to go in our pocket. But yeah, Steve, and the, the whole aesthetic, like, they came out and just were perfect. Right. Everything about them were the costumes, how yeah, they played, the vibe was perfect. And then I just remember smiling to myself, going, God damn it. That son of a bitch. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Yeah, I've seen that band quite a bit. And I, I'd actually venture to say that even like their like less awesome shows are, are at parody with some bands best, uh, for sure. But I've i I've been lucky enough to see like uh three or four where it's just like Well, hell, all right. <laughs> that was an experience and it's it's uh it's it's something to behold for sure they're just they're, they're like we caught them on their like 90 you know they got an a for their show but we just happened to be fully firing on all cylinders right you know probably a top five with sorry fob show but you know i agree with you they're, they're so good you know something that so this is what while, while we're talking about live shows i mean i guess we're going to jump around a little bit here Something I find kind of bold and interesting is that, uh, you know, a couple of, of like, Savvy Fab's biggest block rockers were, like, singles. <laughs> like, yeah. Sweat Descends was never on any record, right? You know, you, you had, like, yeah. a, 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 the, the it, Inches was the compilation album that uh, you put out on, on French Kiss. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, there's a few... Band. I mean, I guess the most extreme example of that would be like The Who, right? But uh, <laughs> but there are bands that like that, much like a lot of things with that band, The you, you put out these uh, seven inches and it wasn't like, oh, here's our throwaway material that, <laughs> that, that wasn't good enough to make the record. It was more like, no, here's something that we want to have be uh, kind of a single serving experience and for the people that it's for. And I, I thought that was very interesting. And very brave, yeah, really, in a way. It, it was on day, you know, the interest collection or project was on day one of the band. Uh, Tim came up with this idea of making a puzzle, or basically creating nine seven inches. We were obsessed with sub pop at the time, like the seven inch club. Right. So when we put a seven inch on sub pop, we're like, oh, well, I can somehow convince other labels to give us money for each seven inch and make this collector's item from nine different labels. Um, but that was like name of the band, what kind of sound you know, we would go for. And then it was like, um, sorry. That's uh, one of the labels calling right now. They're... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Don't forget to mention me. Uh, <laughs> but it was really a situation of like right away this idea launched so then we were sort of bound as a band sort of during the darker times or the times when we were communicating as, as well as we should have been the we were sort of bound to finish this project we couldn't let the kids who bought or the fans who bought you know hey sorry we, we got you know we broke up because we have seven seven inches of the nine so we just sort of <laughs> kept at it um and i think that was an that kind of bound us to this project. So when we finished Inches, we really felt as a band that we like, oh my God, we really accomplished something unique and, and kind of, we were really excited about it. So yeah, we definitely, each label gave us money for a seven inch. We knew that they were going to lose money. We were just so like, okay, what song, what's, what, what's the best song we can give them? What's the best experience we can give them from where we're at now? Uh, but it was great. We worked with so many different people on each seven inch and, it helped us travel, and it was great. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I, love, I love the Inches project. So, so you were saying that it was something that you kind of conceived originally, like from from the top, like from the from the original conception of the band, yeah. huh? Yes. Once we get uh, we, the first one was the Sub Pop Seven Inch, and then we did a Desoto Seven Inch. But basically, 
it was like right away, it's like Tim came up with the idea of, I believe it was Tim. Let's lock him with nine, seven inches and then put them all together as a puzzle. And he right. came with the artwork pretty quickly on, so it was just a time, it was just like finding the labels that would do it. Yeah, I would say that it was pretty, you know, really early on. Once we set them out, that I did hands to hands, but I did it all the time. Yeah, because it's interesting because there there is a kind of small club uh, for something that vast in scope that is clearly just done. Uh. For the love of it, right? Like, like it's not like, not like you're doing that because it's expected to be like some huge seller, uh, necessarily. But it's something where you're just—it's it, like it's like catnip for music nerds to a certain degree. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, and it—it's—I yeah. remember when I got the second one of them, I was like, I was like, oh, there's like a unified theme to this. Like that's, and then then I sort of like started checking and be like, they've been doing this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, was, it ended up being like over like the course of like almost ten years, right? If I remember correctly, before the compilation came out. Probably, yeah. It was probably that long. And you know, along the way, we just like, hey, you, we just meet people. Be like, hey, you, how are doing this collection? Uh, you know, but it was great. It was totally wonderful. It was it was a really nice journey. And and, and on that, I think. Uh, <laughs> Meet me in the dollar bin as a, as a former record store employee uh, was was something where I, I love that that ended up being like you know one of the first ones because it was it was such a perfect example of like the self aware but like celebratory uh, yeah exactly of, of, of welcome, that to the, welcome to the welcome to the right <laughs> uh, well I don't want to I don't want to uh, jump around tons and tons but I I do want to talk uh, talk a bit about Cat and the Cobra which the the first time that kind of came to my attention was uh dishonest dawn because it starts with the like the cd skipping the yeah. um, the one of them does yeah. <laughs> and that's the hook which is something that's like perfectly indicative of the time and of course for the younger listeners there were these things called cds and uh sometimes if you had like a chip player or that you bounced or if you moved weird or something you would get a cd skip um Talk about like making records versus like live and things along those lines. Uh, <laughs> where did the idea for that song, like having like a CD skip as a hook, come out of? Because it's very unique. Again, that was Tim's idea. Uh, we were just playing around with texture. I, I think that the the overall the, the push and pull of Wasabi Fav inside the band is that half the band wants to write a lot of hooks and try to sell records, and the uh, and then. The other sort of conceptual part of the band is to destroy that idea as much as possible. <laughs> so it's this, it's this, it's not, it's like a car that's not going to go anywhere. It's like you want the best car, but you know, it's like Picasso. You want to draw something so well and then destroy it. Right. It's a bit pretentious of me to say, but at the same time, that's how we thought. So we had this really pretty song, the on is done. And then Tim was like, how can we mess with this? How can we create texture and and sound and elements that will destroy in some sort of way, or I'm sure I'm sort of paraphrasing Tim, and obviously it's been 20 years since that record was out, but the idea that Tim is always trying to add texture to the song, and that was one of his ideas to be like, okay, let's play around with the idea of skipping CD. And there's also a sample in there that I do remember every time I hear it, we talk about that sample for hours. What if, you know, what if we get caught? We're gonna go to, like, we, we were so young and naive, but we were trying to sneak the sample into the recording. Right. We were hoping that we never got caught, and we, I mean, we're not gonna get caught if there's a dumb sample, like, going back on it. But, uh, well, it's such a funny thing to be like, that's what we're, we're obsessed with, destroying something that was so pretty. Right. <laughs> And then obsessing about the legal ramifications of what that would look like. Well, sure, but I mean, it, it, that's the problem with like living on the edge. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. You know, not not to like cue the Aerosmith necessarily, but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's got that's got uh, the the mighty Toko on. She does. Uh, uh, some She's vocals. the best. Yeah. Of course, Enon. Um, 
uh, St. Vincent now. She's in St. Vincent band, band which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah, Toko's a, a hero. She's amazing. She's so good. We love Toko to death. I'm gonna I'm gonna have her on the show eventually. We've like uh, been back and forth about it for a while. I'm really I'm really excited. Oh nice. Uh, we we kind of caught up when when they did the Brainiac documentary, uh, right. and uh, the fellas played songs. I, I was I was in Los Angeles. Uh, well, I, I was in the the I was at the Ohio one too, but didn't really get a chance to hang out. But I had the you know the the Romanian Brainiac dudes on the show, and we got to hang out afterwards and. God, what a powerhouse she is! Yeah, she's freaking awesome. Yeah. Also, Brainiac was really good too. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I'm, uh, specifically since we're talking about the Orchard, that got me just to thinking like, just what a, what a kind of unsung hero of weird music in a certain way. Yeah, Natoka's uh, she's the best. She's so her voice is amazing. When she was in Blonde Redhead, I preferred Blonde Redhead when she was in it. Uh, there was just an she's had like a mysterious elegance to her yeah and it just added to that song so much it added sort of this haunting quality to it yeah i was so glad that she and she is on another record later she came back and sang another song i think on let's stay friends oh yeah yeah yeah. that's right i forgot about that yeah that's what we um, get to so cat and the cobra that was the was that the first french kiss release that was the first French kiss release. Mortis on this is, I... Nice. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing, but it was a blast to fail a bunch. Um, but yeah, it was great. To, we all came together to make that record happen uh, and release it and sort of form the label. And, you know, here's a little trivia bit. Juan Mysterio from Brainiac, mm -hmm. it was the initial partner in French kiss. Mm -hmm. We were the ones that started the label together. Oh, wow. I actually didn't know that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And then about six weeks into it, he was like, yeah, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, like, okay. like, it almost seemed like you guys were doing like your own version of like the Discord thing or uh, Touch and Go, but like a macro, macrocosmic? It, yeah, microcosmic? Yeah. I don't know which is right. Uh, yeah. We're, so, you're absolutely right. And I literally called Ian Mackay and I called uh, Corey and it was like, how do I do this? <laughs> and they said, this is how you do it. And they were, I mean, to this day, Corey and Ian are my heroes and they gave me so much good advice. And they said, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And Are you writing a biography? Um, anyway, uh, sorry, my wife had to ask me a quick question. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, uh, they were great. Um, they were really good. Ian was just like, keep it simple. And Corey was, uh, yes. And then Corey said, you know, have a spreadsheet so you know what your costs are and try not to go over them too much. Right. The, That's pretty much it. The, the, oh, hard, the hard logistics of, uh, you know, that maybe people don't always think about when they're, hey, let's do a cool oh, thing. Right, right, right. Let's make a record exactly. label. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, this, you know, and the bands want you to spend money, and then some bands don't want you to spend money, so you got to make sure that you're transparent with how you're spending your money. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so, any, any any memories of for like recording, Cat and the Cobra? Any any? Uh, oh, where, where was the band at I, the time with that? We were we were in good spirits actually. Uh, it was sort of the end of one transition. Uh, yes, any recording stories about Cat and the Cobra, we were happy to work with Nicholas Burns. Uh, he and James Murphy had sort of split amicably and wanted to focus on their own careers a bit. So we sort of dug in with Nicholas on Cat and Cobra. And, but yeah, I'm trying to think about, yeah, it was all this sort of exciting, it was exciting to start a label with that record. Uh, I do have a funny story about when we were on tour with that record, we were in Cleveland and we were on tour with this really pretentious band who I will not name. <laughs> and it was April Fool's Day. So we decided to play the, or I think we played the Orchard three times in a row. Okay. <laughs> like as, as a thing, like to. <laughs> yeah. Like April Fool's, here it is yeah. again. And since no one knew who we were, it didn't matter. 
But it, <laughs> like, oh, this band, all people... these, these <laughs> songs sound the same by this band. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I remember at the end of that show, there was some fan from that was there to see the headliner pretentious fans. And they were asking them how they played a song. Like, well, you know, how do you play that song? And the guitar player like sat down with him and like went over how he played the song. And these are the chords he played and how he came up with these chords. And Seth Jabor and I were sitting there going, what a piece of shit. <laughs> like, why? You're the edge of the stage, like with your guitar, like teaching this fan, like, oh, and this is the chord progression I use for the song. Like everyone else is like trying to break down their gear right. and, and <laughs> meanwhile you're like go you, home. You need help with that? You need... Yeah, like dude, it's an A. He's playing an A. Yeah. This song's not complicated. <laughs> and he was just like waxing, just just going on and on about how he I just ugh. But yeah, that's what I remember yeah, so much. When I wrote this, the Oddly emotional enough, pain was yeah. so extreme that uh yeah, okay, yeah. we get it. Yeah. You're not that's exactly what was happening. <laughs> yeah. So what was the, so you're Cat and the Cobra, you know, that's to a certain degree kind of where like a, like a larger section of the world kind of started to become aware of a savvy fab. Meanwhile, at the same time, you're spinning up the, the endless work and occasional reward that is a, that is a record label. Uh, tell me about the, the headspace of kind of, uh, counterbalancing those two in, in those still early early ish days was um, it was it, it was a challenge i was just absorbing so many things the challenge was that i had put some money on my credit card obviously and i was trying to pay off the credit card and i was also trying to sell the records and convince the band that we need to go on tour even more because we need to sell the record. We didn't really have a distribution deal at the time. So it was a lot of like selling it from our car, selling it from the van. Right. Um, and then they were game. They were totally game, and which was great. And it Cat and Cobra led us to Rome, which we made a deal with the label in, in Chicago and in London called Southern Records. Yep. And then they gave us some money to go to, on tour of Europe, which we had never been on, we've been to. As a band, we've been in visually, but it was all of a sudden really on tour in Europe for the first time. And it was, it was, that was the magic that that's when we realized, oh my God, we're a band. Right. This is amazing. We're going on tour. We are a bunch of art kids that were supposed to have other careers, quote unquote. And here we are traveling and some members of the band had never been on an airplane. Some members of the band had never been to Europe, had never seen. So all of a sudden, you know, they're calling their parents in the middle of, of the Vatican saying, oh my God, my guitar lessons or my bass lessons or my drum lessons or whatever led me to this moment. <laughs> you're, in this, just, you're in this crazy, yeah, this crazy thing is happening. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I just saw the Sistine Chapel and, enough, you know, screw you. So it was these sort of magical moments that led to this, you know, just sort of, you know, sleeping in a van <laughs> down by the river kind of thing, but we were really, really happy. Meanwhile, your old music teacher said, big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I should reach out to them, like, hey, did you ever see the Sistine Chapel? I saw it multiple times. It's really cool. You should see it. It's pretty good. You should totally see yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, it's smaller than you think, you know. And, yeah, it's not pre-COVID. I don't know if that means anything to you. <laughs> Son of an asshole. Uh, but it was just a great... And then that tour led us to Rome. Uh, right before Rome, um, Gibbs Slife, who was playing guitar, left the band. Um, he big sort of change. got a job. He could, yeah. It was a big change, and he got a job he couldn't refuse, basically. Um, and we totally respected it. And it was great. And then Tim also. I mean, uh, it, it was sort of a moment. Also, where Pat was like, you know what? I think, you know, maybe this this might be my last one. Um, so. It was just a great moment when I feel like Rome, to be honest with you, and I think Tim and Seth, we sort of feel the same way that Rome is kind of where we became Les Salvi Fobs. Right. It, it, that's when we had our shit together. We knew how to set up our amps and dial in and do sound checks. And we just knew what we were doing. And we also 
it was a time when Seth Jabor sort of stepped up as the guitar player. He was like, big time. You know, I, yeah, I can write riffs, but I also can do other things. And it was also, we had gone on tour with, played some shows with uh, the Mars Volta um, and at the drive-in and, and Omar had bought this line six pedal that we'd never seen before. And once we saw that, it, we realized that Seth could do anything. It, it basically was a magic spell and we unleashed Seth to pour into the world with that line six pedal. Well, and, and that, that's what that's, became, yeah. there, There's like synths on that one. I mean, there, there's sort of like the, the utilization, it, it feels like there was a very big awareness in composition of using that extra space of, you know, not having like another, not, not, not necessarily having another guitar, but not having another voice in the band, like how to fill that was sort of conscious in a way, yeah. but, but in a way that works. I mean, cause that, I mean, that EP is, <clears throat> that, uh, granted that's where I came in to being aware of you guys. So I was going to hold a special place in my heart because of that. But I mean, it doesn't even, cl- it's even, uh, it's like under 18 minutes. <laughs> And there's yeah. like five rivers, <laughs> it. and it's sort of like it, it occurs to me that even now, like if you just needed a quick because people's attention span has devolved down to nothing, if you just hand them a copy of Rome or whatever, point them to like a thing that plays it on it on the computer, uh, I, I think that's as, still as good as an intro as ever to uh, like Savvy Fab and, and what you guys did because it's just it's relentless but also. Uh, fun, and as much as uh, I still enjoy the, the the first two records, it's like it's definitely that's where the epoch of that era of Le Savvy Fav began very clearly. Yeah, yeah, it feels to us as the band that we sort of came together at that moment, our ideas, and we were allowed to explore them, and we trust each other a hundred percent in that moment. If that makes any sense at all. We did. We we were like, oh, I'll, I'll rely on Seth to do it, this work. Everyone said, you play bass, you play guitar. I'm gonna sing. We all know who we are. We we've been here. We know what this feels like. Now let's just step up, and that's what we felt like we did with Rome. Right. There's there was that trust there that you kind of need to <laughs> to be able to transcend. Yeah, I remember when we were actually recording Rome, written upside down, in the space. We were just sort of looking at each other and just, we were in the moment. We were so present with the sounds that would be created that we were sort of been chasing that feeling ever since. And every once in a while we'll sort of come close to achieving it live, but that's why we keep playing it live because it allows so much of our expression to, to be there. Um, but we're sort of, I'm, I'm at least chasing, I don't want to speak for my other bandmates, but I'm sort of chasing that sort of perfect moment of like, wow, this, this whole thing came together. What's up with the title? Uh, I think Tim or Seth, someone in the band had written or had read I Claudius or something, and they were talking about hexes. Mm-hmm. And we thought it was basically just fascinating that the idea that you were basically putting a hex on somebody by writing something upside down. Oh. Um, it was based on the idea of, of basically creating paranoia um, you know, witchcraft or sort of, uh, sort of, you know, back, back in the days of like, Oh, a, a dead cat crossing the road. It's, it's making someone so paranoid that they sort of lose it themselves. Um, but Rome, I think Rome written and signed out was a hex. Well, and then if you had the physical thing, it is actually written upside down on the record too, which is a, there, there's actually a, there's a name for that concept. I can't. I can't remember what it is, but it, it's where the the visual aesthetic that you see matches the thing that it is a uh, written. You know what I'm talking about? There's there's a name. I, for that. I do, I do. I need more coffee. And I think yeah. of it. But, <laughs> yeah, good. I, I know. That's good to say. Ask me right before I go to bed tonight, and I'll be able to tell you what it is. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, just just add it into the to this interview later, and just be like, oh yeah, bleep. Yeah. <laughs> have, have a real abrupt edit. <laughs> what Conan and Sid are talking yes. about is called. You know. <laughs> yes, I always have to take a pause when I think of Scheidenfreude, but the German word for uh, oh, I know having well. delighted others people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's... you, you got you got to leave it to uh, got to leave it to the uh, the Teutonic folk to come up with a, a word for that and have it just be like a word, which is like, yep. 
Of course. Makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> makes sense. You guys would figure that out. <laughs> so, okay. Rome written yeah, upside down. You, you guys are hitting this new. Uh, yeah, but we had, yeah, we had Harrison playing. It, it, we just had all these moments of everyone was able to express their express, you know, expression, their, their music, their musicality and their expression. And I feel like that's the record that sort of started that past. Definitely. And, and definitely, you know, at, at least made a splash in, in my world. Like I, like I said, when I told that story uh, at the beginning of seeing you guys at the empty bottle, uh, visiting in Chicago and, uh, you know, being told like, yeah, don't, whatever you do, don't mess with Savvy Fab. Like, you got, I mean, it blew me away. And I think it's, it, it was something where I, wasn't quite prepared <laughs> and it's like it's just like you guys were just getting to you know this this uh not the not that it was a uh, you know more relaxed concern before but as a live band too it, it kind of seemed like it was all clicking uh and, and hitting on a different level well i, I yeah i appreciate i think that's when we we're like yeah we're on we're good luck anyone in our wake so that and that's uh, right around, it was like 2000, right? 2000, 2000, like late 2000? Um, yeah, 2000, I think right? it was re- to right around 2000. It was released in 2000 for sure. And the, and of course, so you got, you got um, Go Forth next, which kind of, it's hard. I, again, it's weird to me that the early 2000s, I feel like there hasn't been, I don't know, a a documentary ab- about it or <laughs> something, but like people like don't seem to understand that about that era of music and exactly what happened. I think a few things have sort of like the story has been told, but it's that record made a pretty big impact. Go forth. Like it was something that like, it was, it was not, it was it, not inescapable, but it was ubiquitous in a good way. If that makes sense. It was like, Oh wow. Cool. Right on. Yeah, it was, it was, that was a record that was sort of polarizing in the band. Uh, and yeah, it's sort of like a step kid. Uh, we all love it, but it had a, we, we, people started telling us that we were this great band and we need to write a real record and go and produce it and get a real producer and step up that, that sort of language that people say that was phil eck too who you did all the built to spell yeah. records and uh, lots i mean love his laughter lots of other things yeah phil's the best uh but it, it added an amount of pressure to our quote professional life our professional career that we weren't ready for um so it kind of it's it was an interesting process like we were there Phil was great. I, we all learned so much from Phil on producing records and how to be a band in the studio and and texture, like all these different things of being in the studio. It was great. I love Phil Eck to death. Um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but it, the pressure of that record sort of changed things. I think after that record, we went back to the Seven Inch Collection to be like, oh, we need to control this. We need to feel comfortable with who we are. It had a funny, a funny taste in our mouth with it. So can you? All right. So that's interesting because from from the outside perspective, it's just, um, I mean, it's just it's just a block rocker. Like it's a relatively unrelenting, yeah. you know, super catchy record. Almost, uh, <laughs> you know, again, not not to immediately draw the comparison. Uh, to to another band, but I, I just think about it in terms of uh, like a keep it like a secret from built to spill, where it's like, oh, this song's great, oh, this song's great, oh, this song's great, oh, this song's great, which is yeah, you know, every every band kind of hopes for that, but it, it sounds like uh, internally maybe there was um, what, what was it more like for direction for sound, like what was the uh, you mentioned like the. You know, it didn't sound like there was like unease necessarily, but was there just this idea of like, you know, was it more broad based appeal? Uh, what yeah, was, I, I, is that what it was? I, I think, you know, I'm going to be fair to my, my bear mates. I think I had come in being like, okay, guys, the record label's real. 
And we now have some money to make this record. We have some money to bring in this producer. We have some money now. You know, this is sort of our shot to sort of make a, the best record we can, the biggest record we can, the most, you know, popular record we can, whatever it is. I, I sort of was in the room with that feeling. Uh, so I should be fair to my bandmates. Um, and, but at the same time, I love that record. I think Phil did a great, great. job. There's so many beautiful <laughs> melodies yeah. that Seth does, you know, but I think there's sort of a, a, a slight wink to me in a, in a negative way, which is with that song bloom on demand. Cause I was like, come on guys, we gotta do this. We gotta do this. And Tim was like, I can't just be someone that I'm not. Um, and I think there was some, come on, just try to sing, you know, try to do this. And I think he kind of was like, guys, you know what? That's not who I am. Um, and looking back, I really respect that communication that he Yeah, good on him for, know, for knowing those limits, yeah. right? And for knowing where he was at and being aware of it rather than just internalizing it and being, you know, having that manifest in a different way. Exactly. So I think I was I was the the rotten apple in that bunch. Um, but I still love the record. And, you know, f f I learned so much from Phil on producing records and how to even communicate with bands and what was needed. And it was just, it was a, so that part of it was a great experience. But I wish he kind of came back to some of those, some of those songs. There, you know, there's some great ones in there. I mean, I love No Sleeves. It's one of my favorite bass lines. Oh, I yeah. just love that song as well. <laughs> so, Okay, so well, that and that's fascinating because because to me it just seems like a, a, again from the perspective of the listener, it just kind of seems like that would be just a triumphant romp, especially because like tonality, like none of that none of that stuff that you mentioned internally comes across at all within the record. But then there's a difference, you know, like <laughs> look at Fleetwood Mac too. You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you yeah. don't know no, if you didn't watch the behind the music, you wouldn't have any idea. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, we all getting along and happy and, and all those moments were, were great recording it, but I think I was just a, uh, uptight about trying to. Kind of, was it kind of like reach for the yeah. brass ring kind of in, in your way yeah. kind of mindset? Yeah. I think I wanted something that they didn't want. Gotcha. Um, well, well, but also to be fair and context wise, there was a, a, a kind of, energy around at the time you know b bands like yourself uh dismemberment plan like they had finally yep. gotten emergency exactly. out uh, where it's sort of like oh this this certain type of weird music that you know there's elements of it that you know are crazy and, and come from you know this sounds like fugazi and sounds like drive like jehu or whatever but then there's also like this pop element to it that kind of hits in a different way and that really hadn't been done and it certainly hadn't been done with any audience or awareness by the press and of course it also correlates with the rise of things like pitchfork media and stuff like along those lines and uh, whatever you want to call the alt press at the same time, it kind of seems to all be happening at once and be happening during like, not, if not a if not a gold rush, a silver rush. Yeah, totally. <laughs> You're absolutely right, and and all of a sudden we were like in every sort of local publication of like mixed together with all these other bands. Right. It was sort of the, the age of that, and you know, thank God we were. That some of these bands were amazing. <laughs> well, totally. Are, are still amazing. Yeah, but but it's it's also like uh you, you know some some of the bands like it wouldn't necessarily be they are fantastic some of them it's it's like you guys are coming across as like the the art school graduate degree person and they're like more hitting it like maybe a I don't know sophomore level or something along those lines from the outside but uh but to have that time where people were present and people were like ready for something different and new I mean that's that's kind of nice and and you guys took advantage of it there was a there was just a, a stunning amount of uh of activity lots of touring you've you finished uh more of the seven inches that eventually ended up on inches and at the same time you're kind of still spinning things up uh growing 
French Kiss Records, was there a like a a balance that you had to strike because it wasn't like you were like sitting idle the entire time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was it was great to go on tour and meet other bands that then would eventually be on French Kiss. But you know, I had people that were working for me at the time being like, "You can't go on tour anymore. We need you here, right, to do the work." <laughs> to do the work you can't just play all the time and of course i was like i just want to play you guys work you guys do spreadsheets and bills i don't want to do that you know and then of course they won in the end i had to come home and pay attention to the bills and to the bankers and Thanks. i mean it's that's the part that never no one ever talks about the running record label right that and the the endless uh the endless demos. Yep, exactly. <laughs> People sending in their demos, and it's like, oh, it's, this is fine, but uh, I'm not going to be able to do the thing that you, you think that I can do for you. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very, I had to get back and realize that I wasn't, that the, the world wasn't magic. So. So you're you're, uh, go, you're going ahead with French Kiss. There's there's a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, the the couple of the seven inches come out, but for the most part, as for Lee Savvy Fav as a uh, band releasing records, it's a while until there's like a, a new full length. I mean, I, like Let's Stay Friends was 2007, right? So that, I mean, that's that's a whole epoch of time. Like civilizations rise and fall during a time period that long between uh, <laughs> between records for some. Exactly. Now, let's do friends. Now things are changing. So can you yes. speak speak to the, I mean, to anyone with the slightest bit of awareness of bands and band dynamics? You know, the title alone it could be somewhat evocative, uh, but you're a much different band. It's all those things. <laughs> yeah. It's all those things. Yeah. Let's okay. say friends is... It was like all the moments, it was so much like we found the studio, we found the producer who we loved working with, everyone loved working with. We uh, we were sort of still a band, but not really. We all sort of sort of taken some time off. We had decided that we had other interests in our life. I had to focus on French Kiss. Um, Tim started focusing on his uh, uh, d- artistic director and advertise like he wanted to sort of explore these different things. Harrison wanted to work on his paintings and his artwork. We all just sort of took a break and started focusing on other paths. But we had this this song that just sort of kept knocking on the door that we that needed to come out that needed to be released. And so we worked with a producer Chris Zane in a studio, a uh, gigantic that we we're very comfortable with. Um, and I think also Pitchfork was like, hey, let's Savi Fav, what are you guys doing? They sort of kept nudging us. Right. And then we had a label in Europe. Like everything was sort of there for us to take advantage of. And so when we went in, it was like, you know what? We have the most time in the studio. We have, we're getting along the most with these songs, it was sort of a moment of, let's get our friends who we've met along the way to be part of this journey with us. And it, it was sort of those things that helped us make the record. I think it was just like, hey, let's have five, go make a record. We wouldn't have done it. But right. it was so many positives that were like, hey, Gigantic will give you, you know, three weeks in a studio or something. We've never had that much time in the studio. And Zane will give us a deal. And like everything just sort of fell into our place that we're like, you know what? We are friends. We are a band that we sort of we started and recalibrated who we were as La Sauvage Club and, and were able to go in and make that record. Well, you had a friendly environment. You had all these different elements coming in play that would be like, hey, this, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you know, it's, it's so sometimes it's more work than others uh, just for the logistical aspects. But it sounds like the environment was set that it was just was a good time to make a record for lack of a better term. It, it really, it really was. Um, and I don't think we kind of thought this is, this was going to be it. Like we'd finished really our, our journey. Yeah. We sort of like, I, I didn't think there was going to be another one. So we're like, this is it guys. Let's just have fun. Let's just go and do it. 
uh, we had this, w Wichita was going to release the record in Europe. So we had better distribution and like, we just had all these things that were sort of there and ready for us to sort of, we knew who we were. We knew what we were about. We knew what we could achieve. Our expectations were low. So we went in and made it, but you know, it, we love that record. We love those songs. Uh, you know, Fred Armisen played on Pots and Pans. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just... John and Toko, are both, uh, they're both on it in different songs. Exactly. Uh, we had just, you know... And Matt, just let's got married. Matt <laughs> Exactly. Love Matt Schultz. That guy's, uh, that guy's the best. Um, you know, I, uh, Tim had just had a child. I had just had a child. Uh, so it just seemed like this was it. This was. There was a lot of other life going on, other obligations, other interests, other things maybe that had been neglected before that had time to flourish and, yeah. if you will, bloom. Exactly. That that needed the focus, but it's also, I mean, there's some songs in there have some, you know, some of the most monster hooks of any other savvy fav song at all. I mean, like, what would wolves do? Patty Lee, but then there's also like rippers as well. Like it, it does, it doesn't sound like a, uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound like a late period band record, if that makes sense. <laughs> that that could sound insulting in the wrong hands, but I assure you, I don't mean it that way. I, I don't feel insulted. You can in, listen. <laughs> you can insult us other father. Like yeah, I, I, I see your insult. I, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I. It just felt like the. He just everything was there. Andrew Royland had joined the band, who was our longtime um, dearest friend, and we went to RISD with us. It just all we were just communicating really, really well. Um, but it was great. I mean, the question is still one of the Patty Lee. What would Wolves do? You know, the the dub side of Brace Yourself. You know, I was obsessed with dub at that time, and I was I kept trying to sort of push. Hey guys, can we make a dub record? Remember Rome, or can we do this? And so everyone was sort of allowed to sort of make their dream song. Right, and and I would also say that uh, the kickoff song "Pots and Pans" is sort of from the from the from the great school of thought that is somewhat akin to the "Meet Me in the Dollar Bin," which is the uh, sort of self-aware people in bands writing about being in bands, but doing so in kind of a, a, a clever way and noting something that really hadn't been articulated before. Yes, I thought Tim's. I, I remember. Yeah, Tim's lyrics were very good. I, I love Tim's lyrics on this album the most. I think overall, his sort of collection of lyrics for this record is his best. Uh, I just think he's just his puns, his rhyme schemes are just great. I mean, I, one of my favorite songs that we, I think we played once or twice live is "Slugs in the Shrubs." Right. It's just that song live is blistering decimating it there's there's nothing you can play after it <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and it's not it, it's not really good for a last song either it just it's like you get gut punched the guitar sound is so brit brutal and the beat is just it's just this sonic blast so it kind of we don't really play it anymore because it's just this you're done after that there's nothing to do there's nothing <laughs> it's to too say. difficult to uh to do anything afterwards sequencing wise <laughs> yeah we call it we call it we have certain songs in our set list we call drink spillers <laughs> where like someone's sort of talking holding their beer all of a sudden the song starts and they're not ready for it and their beer goes flying everywhere just they sort of spill their drink nice um and that's yeah. that's one of them so we're just like oh we can't you know at least with like the equestrian start with seth people are you know Oh, this is a great rock song. It kicks in, or you know, they have all these intros, but but slugs just start. Right, right. You, you've you've got some advance. Like it calls ahead a little bit. You know that, like okay, yeah. there's, there, 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 I know it's coming. <laughs> yeah. So slugs is not that song. So it, it's it's. Just, I love it so much, but it's a song we don't play live. I wish we did, but we don't know how to. I mean, not physically, we know how to, but emotionally, I don't know if we know how to anymore. Was there, uh, so, and and so after that record, of course, there's that live album, uh, which which is fantastic. Being known as kind of a as a, you know, a great live band, was there a any internal discussion or strife or uh, or consternation about 
putting out a live album. I mean, because there's like, as we mentioned before, there's like making records and there's live, right? And there's a rich tradition of great live records and there's a whole bunch more that are mediocre or, you know, not great. <laughs> yeah, we, we were nervous about making a live record. I kind of, I know that we did it and we wanted to just sort of document that one show. Um, but I remember I kept drinking too much and my bass line suffered. Mm-hmm. And we, I think it was done at like three in the morning by the time the record had finished live. We were just so fried and exhausted, but I'm glad that it exists. Right. You know, after a, the ball it, was is... it, was, it was a New Year's, yeah, New Year's yeah. Eve show. So it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you want to get the celebratory vibe of it, but a celebratory vibe isn't necessarily going to be a letter perfect performance either. But it's, you know, there's also live. Exactly. Uh, I love that there's just a suite of covers on that too. You know, that's uh, oh. one of my favorite CCR songs. Um, that's a great CCR song. So good. It, yeah. <laughs> it's a great, it's a, it's a fun, I mean, I'm glad it, I really am glad it exists. But man, I was, I don't think I've had that much to drink at New Year's since. <laughs> well, I, luckily it's documented and recorded for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think that was the, I was like, you know what? I, I don't remember, like, I don't remember it. It was just, I'm glad it exists because, you know, I remember like learning those cover songs and being like pretty tight on them. Like, yeah, I feel really good about these cover songs. And then that night being like, what song are we doing? Right. What song is this? <laughs> the Pixies. Who? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, because you got you got CCR. There's Pixies, Misfits, Nirvana, and Love, yeah. and they're all great bands. Yeah. So I'm just, sure it was. <laughs> I, I I realized that Kim Deal's bass lines are a little behind the beat, and when you're kind of saucy, that you can't be that much more behind the beat. Or you're turned into tar. <laughs> Right, right. You, if you get too far behind, it, it's this is not going to work. <laughs> yeah, then you're on top of the beat. <laughs> yeah, everyone else is you got to sink it's full, like, it's, full circle. It's like when you're uh, running track and you get lapped. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a moment I, I stood on stage being like, I'm getting lapped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we uh, can we can we talk a little bit about Root for Ruin as well? Yes, I first one of my favorite records we ever did, and we didn't tour on it, so no one really knows it's there. Yeah, because but... it, it it does seem like almost like the lost, not lost, but <laughs> an underappreciated no, it, record in the pantheon. I I absolutely agree with you. Uh, we're re releasing it on vinyl. Oh, killer! Um, awesome. In twenty next year, I'm pretty excited about it. But I mean, it has I mean, dirty nails, appetites. These are you know. Uh, Clear Spirits to this day is one of the band's favorite songs. No one likes it. When we went into <laughs> Master It, the guy who mastered the record's like, no joke. He goes, You want this song on the record? <laughs> wow. And we were like, Yeah. And like, in fact, we went first. Yeah. And he was like, No, 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 no. You, I, my, in my 50 years of, of mastering records, I think that you should put this song on last. And basically convinced us to put it on last, but no one hears it because it's the eleventh song on the record, and no one, yeah, has paying attention to the eleventh song. But the drum beat is so good. Tim's lyrics are so good that it's just we, the band loves that song so much. Um, but yeah, well, I love like, that record. And uh, yeah, oh, I was just gonna say sequencing. Like you know, people that that don't make records maybe don't realize it, but you know, sequencing is can be you know almost like a creative sophie's choice sometimes because you know certain things it, certain songs will not get the attention that they maybe you think they deserve oh and i fight we fight with our with other bands on french kiss all the time we just in fact we just had a band we're working with that the entire label that just like everyone said this is your sequence these are your singles and band and management came back and said nope this is the song that we want to go with as their first single. I'm like, no, this is your worst song on the record. Absolutely. This sets up the record to fail. Nope. This is our best song and we're going to go with it. And I remember being like, well, it's your bed. We just won't give you as much money because 
it's going to be tricky. But if you think this is your best song and you want to lead with this song and if you don't get the press you wanted and it's fine, just know that. Uh, but I remember someone brought up, I think it was Paul brought up this whole conversation and Clear Spirits being like, hey man, you wanted to go Clear Spirits as your best and everyone said no. And like, you know, don't eat your words a bit. Let the band have their have their single so it's and it's funny that even you know in the, in the 10 years since then it's almost even more important because now you get like maybe like one distracted listen somebody like playing playing it through their phone or something along yeah. those lines like it's, it's even hard it's harder to get someone to listen to something sequentially Is that an idol? Uh, just by nature of the add riddled Oh, world. My four, yeah, my fourteen-year-old daughter listens to her song for twenty-five seconds, not even thirty. She's like, "How about this song next? Like this song? Like you know, there's a there's a bridge in this song. It's great." <laughs> right. should... I was gonna say she she wouldn't get past the intros of some of your songs. <laughs> but that's 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 the way the world is now, and it's something where it it, it does. It's harder to make an artistic statement that way and kind of play with the form. And that's something I always felt like Savvy Fav that. You guys enjoyed playing with the form and and doing things that are exciting to you as listeners, but as a band. And I feel like that the glee is maybe the wrong word word, but I, I feel like that excitement always comes across in all the different records and all the different things that you'd have done. There's no question there. Yeah. I'm just this. No, no, I'm I'm, I'm listening. I'm entering into I'm, the second record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the French kids put out a record that was one, still one of my favorite records we put out on the label, which is the Machine Gum record. That it's Fab from the Strokes' side project. I think it's a beautiful record. I love it to death. It has a song called City Walls on it that my wife, it was like, you know, I love this song so much. My daughter was like, I love this song so much. We're going to make a video. They made a fan made video for it. It's great. But the band's just like, yeah, it's the 11th, 12th song on the record. It's not a single. We just don't want to push it. Right. And I was like, I respect that, but check out how good this song is. It should have been the second song. Like, it's very much in that world that we live in where, you know, people definitely don't go to song 11 on their Spotify playlist. Yeah, everything's got to be like hyper front loaded. It's got to be just immediate. Yeah, hyper front loaded. Immediate payoff. And if there isn't an immediate payoff, it's whoops, on to the next thing. And that's. Uh... Yeah, I remember when Apple, t- Apple iTunes came up. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, you have the entire Modest Mouse catalog. Right. This is amazing. Everything is right there. And then I remember just being so disappointed seeing like the first song, five stars, like nothing. The first song on the second record, five stars, nothing. Like no one had explored. Beyond the first song. Beyond the first song. And then like by the sixth song or seventh song on Lonesome Carter West, it's got like no love. And you're like, this is where this is where the, yeah, that's the where it gets good. this record is so good. <laughs> Well, one especially, uh, you know, and and Modest Mouse was definitely they, they caught like the, the tail end of the of the CD era where you know, some of those records it's like oh there's so many songs on here and like it's not that like the ones at the end are bad it's just it's like oh god it's just you know it's so long like it would it wouldn't necessarily be how they would maybe choose to release it, that music now but yeah just just to watch like the uh, the curve right. Yeah. <laughs> just watch like diminishing listens, diminishing attention, just by nature of how people choose to listen now, and and how we just live in a in a different world with sort of availability of almost everything and constant competition for everyone's attention. Uh, yeah, definitely is a anyway. Yeah, people listen to music differently than they used to. I guess is the the point of that statement. But it's it's definitely a thing, and I've certainly noticed it myself as well as a fan of the record as a form. Yeah. Well, hell, man, this this has been great, Sid. Thanks so much for uh, going through all this with me, and uh, you know, I think we covered a lot. Is there anything that? Uh, I mean, I, I honestly no, do think Lee Savvy Fab is like one of the most not unsung but sort of underappreciated bands of like the modern era, and I think that's going to be something where at some point there's going to be a resurgence where people, you know, kids going to figure it out. <laughs> I, you know, it's very kind of you. I, it, it was a great, it's a great part of my life. I, you know, I, we still talk to each other. We're still friends. And I think that was sort of the goal at the end that 
as things got rough or things got great, that we'd always, it, when things were getting irritable, you know, that there's, I wrote this book called Who Farted Wrong. Oh, I, that's the one thing. Yes, thank you. I had a note for that uh, yeah. when we were talking earlier and I, and I completely forgot about it. Yeah, thank you. But basically the title is, you know, you're in a van with someone and someone parts and you're just like, man, you did that wrong. You get to a port of irritation and no matter what, how much you love these people, that they just irritate the shit out of you. There's nothing you can do. Um, and we got to that point where it's like, we're just, you're doing it wrong. You're just breathing wrong. You're just here wrong. Right. You're and, existing wrong. <laughs> yeah. And we, and we knew right away, like if we ever got to that point, we just need to take a breather and take a break. And we now have this very healthy approach to being in a band. And I, listen, it's fantastic that, if you told me that I'd be almost 50 years old and having a conversation about the Savi Fav or the fact that we'd be playing Primavera, fingers crossed, next year at their 20th anniversary, like all these different things that they, the, the world exists for the bands that and the music that we wrote still exists. There's still a place for it. It's amazing that, you know, I feel sad for like up and coming bands that are trying to break into those festival slots because they're still filled with shellac and Felt the spill and the Savi Fav and yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have all these bands that are still playing because there's still an audience for their music. Right. And I just, I just so appreciate as a musician that the kind of music and the art that I come up with in my living room is still listened to and respected. So I, I just really appreciate this interview. I really appreciate you even listening and, and going through our catalog and listening to the songs. You know, those 10 hour drives, you're like, I hope someone's listening. <laughs> so I really, I really, I appreciate right. the people that are listening to this this podcast and, and to you. And it just, it gives us still hope that there's still a, a place to make cool, creative music. Well, that's awesome. And, and I think that that's, uh, you know, all what you, what you said is, is very important. I think it's, it's easy to forget, too, in a very busy world that, you know, people get touched by things in, in various ways. And it isn't always in the most overt way that the person creating the thing realizes until right. later. And it's, it's easy to forget. And it's, it's important. It's easy to forget. It's important to remember, which sounds like it's a, you know, fortune cookie or something, but I, <laughs> it's a, it's a great fortune cookie. That's a, you should make it, you should make a hat or a, a shirt that says that. Yeah. Put it, put it on a hat. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So last thing, Sid, I want to thank you so much, first of all, for, for being so uh, giving of your time and doing this. It's been a real treat. I have one canned question I ask everybody. You can interpret it however you like. The question is, why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? It's a great question, actually. Uh, I do what I do because I wake up in the morning and there's a little demon inside me that says, you've got to create something today. And it's however depressed I am or unmotivated or sad or happy, I have this itch. It's like a cruel mistress. I wake up in the morning and something has to be made. I feel like I haven't lived my life or I haven't been a good father or mentor or role model to my kids. If I haven't seen the world the best way it can be seen, and what can I do, what can I see to sort of keep that happiness or that, that itch alive? And I feel really sad for people that don't have that itch, but Tim has that itch, Chef Sabor has that itch, the people I surround myself with wake up every morning and they have that itch. They have to play music. They have to make art. They have to do something to fulfill their creative sense. So why do I do what I do? Because it's telling this a little demon inside me saying, get up and do it. Just be a little bit better today than you were yesterday. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to like, my daughter takes martial arts and that she has the greatest sensei or whatever, whatever he is, uh, He's always like, don't think about where your foot is when you kick a person in the face. Think about raising your knee to mm -hmm. kick her in the face. So most people think about the end result. I can't write this book. I can't write this song. I can't, I can't, I can't. Because they're thinking about the end result. But you have to think about the first step. First step, okay, I'm here. I'm in front of my desk. Okay, tomorrow I'll get in front of my desk and I'll write the word, the. And they just like add this a note or just add something, just add something to the creative process and all of a sudden you'll be done with it. And you would have written a record, you would have written a book, you would have made a drawing. So, and then you want that itch again and all of a sudden that book, you don't care about that book or that record, it becomes old hat. All of a sudden 
there's a new itch, there's a new story to tell. So that's what keeps me going, uh, doing what I do. I just have these things that wake me up every day. Like, oh, I can't, I can't lie in bed every morning because I have a story that I want to write about a, a horror movie or, a, you know, I, I've got to do something else because this itch is telling me to do it. Just I have that itch. And it won't, it won't let me be lazy. I love it. Sid, thanks so much, man. This has been a treat. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. If there's anything you need, just call me back and I'll try to ramble on even more. Bye. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Take care. Thank you. Okay, bye. Oh, there he goes, Sid Butler. What a good time. What an awesome dude. <laughs> All right. Let's hear, let's hear uh, let's have a chat song. i
know who built this house and you know who will tear it down you know who built this house and you know who will tear it down It broke the backs of the trees in the forest It brought the rats to their knees in the city You thought you were safe, you thought you were strong A kiss and a cough, now everyone's gone All right, Sleepers Union, off of Rome written upside down, and before that, the sweat descends off of the, the ever so fantastic Inches, Inches, which is the uh, the singles compilation that makes the puzzle, so we talked about that earlier on, uh, how cool, how cool is that? Answer, very cool. 
Well, there you go, folks. Sid Butler, everybody. Play Savvy Fab, French Kiss Records, HG Band. Awesome. Uh, that guy's all over the internet on the, the, the things you would expect him to be on. Sid Butler. Sid with a with a Y. It's S Y D. <laughs> I think it's Sid Sid F K R <laughs> on Twitter. Of course, if you want to find all things French Kiss Records, uh, FrenchKissRecords.com. Let's have you fabs uh, on the internet and on all the places you get your music. There's like SavvyFab.com as well. I have no idea when uh, <laughs> when that was last updated. <laughs> Signing off, Mr. and Mrs. America, all the ships at sea. The name of the show is Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. It airs Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific, also at other times, on RadioNope.com. Say yes to no. protonicreversal.com for the archives for every episode you can, it's searchable <laughs> patreon.com slash protonicreversal to get the episode sooner a dollar a month will get you there no ads no sponsors no kidding thanks for sharing the show around it helps people find out about it and uh yeah thanks for listening can you hear me now stay safe out there And take it easy. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. But there is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. 
isn't really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. See?